<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what you see in my hands is the faithful reproduction of the very first model 1894 Winchester rifle. This one is made by Uberti. And the specialty of this rifle is that it is an exact copy of what John Moses Browning designed in 1893-94. So there is no silly crossbolt safety, there is no angle ejection, nothing, just as John Moses designed it in the end of the 19th century. The caliber of this rifle is special also because it's 3855, which is a very, very iconic Western caliber. It's a straight for rifle cartridge. This is, let's say, the scaled down version of the 4590. It's a very special caliber. And this is exactly the very, very first caliber, rifle caliber that this design, this rifle design was made for. But before we continue, let me thank you for your support, your donation through Patreon, or buying your authentic American Civil War percussion revolver cartridge boxes and percussion revolver cartridge formers, or US Arsenal stadias, or powder measure sets, or rubber printing plates for Arsenal bundles, or our flintlock multi-tools. They all help to keep the quality of our channel high. Without you, this would be much, much more difficult. So thank you very much again. The Model 94 Winchester rifle was the first American-made rifle that was chambered for a smokeless round. But in fact, the United States was quite late with this project because in the 1880s, most of the key European military powers were already changing to the smokeless rounds. The first one was the label rifle, the Model 1886 label rifle in France that was chambered for a small caliber bullet, which is uh, an 8mm bullet. It's a jacketed bullet with a lead core, propelled by smokeless powder. It was a self-contained cartridge, of course, a center fire self-contained cartridge, which was a quite huge step in military history. The gun makers of the United States were under pressure to react to these European changes. And the perfect man for this job was John Moses Browning. He was very creative, innovative, and he was very fast in coming out with new designs. There is a story about him when he was designing the Model 1892 rifle. Thomas Gray Bennett from the Winchester firm requested a new design very quickly that can replace the obsolete Model 1873 Winchesters. The problem with the 1873 Winchester is the toggle link action which cannot withstand high pressures. So the Model 1892 was supposed to make the rifle stronger and simpler, probably cheaper as well. He offered 10,000 US dollars if Browning can finish the job in three months with the design and he increased it to 15,000 if he can do it in two months. The answer of Browning was epic. He said that I will do it for 20,000 in 30 days. And if I fail to keep the deadline, you will get it for free. And he did it, of course. The design of the Model 1894 rifle was just as fast. It is little known that the real demarcation line between smokeless and black powder cartridges is not 94. We all think that the Model 1894 rifle was immediately marketed in 3030 Winchester center fire caliber, which is a smokeless round. It was the first famous smokeless round, still available today, still an excellent hunting cartridge and also very good for target shooting. But the 94 demarcation line was necessary because Winchester firm had some problems with manufacturing the nickel steel. That's a stronger steel that could withstand the high pressures of smokeless round. So in 94, when these rifles were marketed, they actually came out in a black powder cartridge caliber, caliber which was the 3855 and the 3240 calibers. They are all very good calibers, and this rifle is a 38, 3855 caliber, which means that a very authentic repro of the very, very first 1894 Winchester rifle, which makes Capendel very happy. My first cartridge to drive was charged with 44 grains of 3F Swiss powder and a 255 grain Lyman bullet, cast from 1 to 40 parts of tin to lead alloy. The lubrication of the bullet is mixed from tallow, beeswax and synthetic engine oil. The distance is 50 meters and the point of aim is the bottom center of the black aiming mark.
Happy times, ladies and gentlemen. This is the 3F charge cartridges, which means that we have 44 grains of 3F Swiss powder in it with the 255 grain bullet, which is a close copy of the original. And I have one, two, three, four, five shots here. So all the shots are in the target. This is, of course, not in the center of the target because I did not set the sights, but I don't care about it right now because I only care about the group size. And out of the five shots, I already have four in the size of the tendering, which is five centimeters, around two inches, which is quite good, ladies and gentlemen. This is quite good. That's a good start for this rifle. The model 1894 rifle first appeared in the number 53 catalog of the Winchester firm and it was offered only in the two caliber that I mentioned and they were both black powder cartridges. So the real change arrived in 1895 when Winchester finally solved the issues with manufacturing the receivers and the barrels from nickel steel and they were finally marketing the rifle in two additional calibers which were the 3030 Winchester center fires and the 2535. They are all smokeless calibers. So it is true that the model 1894 rifle is the first American smokeless rifle design but in fact it was born in the black powder age which is very good for cotton ball also so whenever you buy an original model 1894 rifle be sure to check the production date because if it is pre-1895 then uh, stick with black powder if it's after 95 then you can go for smokeless rounds winchester's first lever action designed to handle strong rifle cartridges was the model 1876 rifle it was technically nothing more than a scaled-up 1873 Winchester. The model 1876 rifle was big and heavy. It was John Moses Browning who accepted the challenge to put Winchester into the future. He designed a new system in 1886 that used twin locking lugs behind the bolt that allowed the use of stronger rifle cartridges like the 4570, 4590. The model 1892 rifle, that was technically the scaled-down version of the model 1886 rifle, that was chambered for the popular revolver rounds. The strength of the model 1894 rifle is the locking system. Instead of using the twin locking lugs of the 1886 and 92 models, it is using one single locking lug. It has a hole for the firing pin and it actually has a transfer bar, which means that the rifle just cannot be fired if the lock is not fully engaged. So it is very, very safe. With the new raw material, it is strong as well, which means that we have a very light rifle. We have a pistol frame rifle, so technically this is a small frame rifle that is capable of shooting the strongest available rifle cartridges of the 19th century. And that is the single unique selling point of this rifle, and this is what made this rifle the best selling rifle in the world. The action fed the cartridges from a tube magazine, meaning that the flat bullet head was still necessary for safety. The elevator raises the cartridge in a slight angle to the chamber, meaning that the proper crimp of the cartridge is also vital. Let's talk about the history of the 3855 cartridge. That cartridge existed well before the 94 Winchesters. It was uh, born as a collaboration between two great companies, Marlin and Ballard. Charles H. Ballard and John Mellon Marlin designed this cartridge that was already used for Marlin lever action rifles. In the second half of the 19th century, Ballard was mainly producing rifles that were chambered for rimfire rounds, they were target shooting rifles. But in 1875, they signed an agreement with Marlin to redesign the system to be able to fire stronger center fire cartridges and to produce these rifles in the Marlin facilities. The first appearance of the model, uh, the first appearance of the 3855 cartridge was in 1876 when a new Ballard rifle, the number 5 Ballard rifle, in cooperation with Marlin, appeared. That was called the Perfection Rifle. It was intended for hunting and it was already chambered for the 3855 cartridge that held a nominal diameter 38 caliber bullet and 55 grains of holy black powder. Later the same cartridge was used in Marlin lever action rifles as well, like the model 1881 rifle and the model 1893 rifle. So it appeared well before the Winchester rifle. As the model 94 rifle appeared in 3855 caliber, Winchester started to produce that car cartridge as well. It was quite common to copy others' cartridges and chamber rifles for others' cartridges as well. Marlin did the same. It is interesting, however, that it was not charged with 55 grains of black powder. According to the 1895 catalogue of the Winchester firm, we can find the specifications for these 3855 caliber cartridges, which says that the cartridge was loaded with a bullet cast from one part tin and uh, 40 parts lead alloy. It was a 255 grain flat point bullet and the 
propelling charge was 48 grains of black powder. The granulation is not mentioned in the cartridge section, but it is mentioned in the reloading section that uh, they recommend one FG corn size for these calibers. Let's talk about the Uberto reproduction. It's a faithful repro. As I said, there is no crossbolt safety, there is no safety on the tank, there is no angle ejection. Everything is just as John Mazes Browning designed it in the 19th century. Even the barrel is a close copy of the original. So with the black powder shooter in mind, they copied the original specifications of the bore as well, which means that the groove to groove diameter of this bore is 379 to 380, which is close to the original. The grooves are deeper a bit. And also the twist rate is the same, which is one turn in 18 inches. Today's 3855 repros are usually uh, uh, made with a faster twist bore, and also they are usually designed for the 375 diameter bullets. But this is the original, which means that this rifle is shouting for black powder charges. The standard barrel length for a rifle like this at Uberti is 26 inches, and it has a beautiful octagonal profile, which is a must have for cap and ball. The butt plate is the so called crescent form butt plate, which is very good for standing position and very painful if you're shooting the rifle in the prone position. The rifle is equipped with traditional sights, which means we have a rear sight, a back horn rear sight uh, adjustable for windage and elevation, and we also have a front sight that is adjustable for windage. We can set both sights, which means that uh, the rifle can be properly zeroed, which is good. The trigger pull is also beautiful. It's good for target shooting, good for hunting, and it breaks like glass. Love it. The stock and the forehand are made of walnut, and it has a high glossy finish, which usually people don't like. Well, I'm not a fan about it as well, but I can live with it. The magazine of the rifle is just as long as the bore, and it holds nine 3855 rounds. Uberti paid attention to the authentic markings, so all the metal stampings on the bore are in the spirit of the original. The 3855 was never the strongest cartridge on earth. According to the 1895 catalog, the muzzle velocity of this cartridge, of this bullet, was only 1,285 feet per second, which is very close to the velocity that I received from 30 grains of 3F black powder in my 44 caliber Winchester. But what's the difference now? Well, the difference is in the trajectory. It is a much flatter trajectory that the 3855 was capable of. First, Second, it's a smaller caliber, longer bullet, which means that it has much better energy retention on longer ranges. My second cartridge was a close copy of the original Winchester Black Powder 3855 cartridge. I charged them with 48 grains of 1.5 F Swiss powder and a 255 grain Lyman bullet, cast from 1 to 40 parts tin lead alloy. The lubrication was the same meaning beeswax, tallow and synthetic engine oil. The capacity of today's 3855 cases is significantly smaller than the 19th century versions, meaning that the 48 grains of 1.5 Swiss powder will be a heavily compressed charge. Distance is 50 meters, the aiming point is the bottom of the black aiming mark. Let's check it. And ladies and gentlemen, this is quite close to the original charge. A 48 grains of 1.5 F Swiss powder. It's a compressed charge, and it seems like it is not working as good as the 44 grains of 3F Swiss powder, which gave a much tighter group. Let's check the velocity of the 3F loaded cartridge first. It 
jumper as well. Four hundred and thirty meters per second. That's good. This equals 1,410 feet per second. Quite good for a black powder cartridge. Let's check the velocity of the reproduction cartridge. Than 17 meters per second. We can also find some information about the terminal ballistics of this cartridge in the same catalog. It said that it penetrated from 15 feet distance nine and a half pine wood planks. Just a comparison, the 4570 405 cartridge, so this was the first 1873 model cartridge for the Springfield Trapdoor rifles, the military cartridge, that penetrated 14 of this. The outer ballistics of this uh, 4570-405 cartridge was nearly the same as this uh, 3555 cartridge of Winchester, by the way. But from a logistics point of view, the new cartridge was clearly better because it needed less lead, less brass and less powder. Cheaper, lighter. The scientific approach to understand terminal ballistics arrived in the second half of the 19th century, when high-velocity small-caliber conical bullets appeared. When impacting above the barrier of sound, they showed intensive damage to the surrounding tissue. The first method to examine this effect was shooting the bullets into clay blocks. Now here is the recreation of this early ballistic test. Now there are things you expect and things you don't. Well, this is what you don't expect. I'm showing the, the temporary cavity, I guess, but we are going to cook, cut some slices from it to see what's inside. And just from the outside, this looks like a beautiful energy transfer. Beautiful energy transfer. I don't know if it caught the shot or not, but we will see. Probably it exited. It exited. Oh, yeah. huh? Look at that. That is a beautiful energy transfer. We did not catch the bullet, but that's not a problem. But what we see is that if I push this back, we have a beautiful, 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 beautiful temporary cavity here. Flat point the muzzle energy of this round is 1530 joules. The Winchester company also offered a lightweight cartridge for target work that was charged with 20 grains of black powder and 155 grain lead bullet, that was a pure lead bullet. And it also offered a smokeless round that was replicating the full charge muzzle velocity of the 3855 cartridge, which means 1,285 feet per second. It was charged with 19 grains of smokeless powder. We don't know the exact type of smokeless powder that they were using for this cartridge. And the same 255 grain bullet that we were, they were using for the full load black powder cartridge. The transition between the black powder charges and the smokeless charges was not easy because there were plenty of rifles on the market that were designed for, for the black powder gas pressures. Even if they were center fire, self-contained cartridge firing rifles, they were designed from inferior materials. Which means that Winchester had to divide their cartridges, cartridges into two main groups. The first group was intended to be fired from originally black powder rifles. These cartridges were replicating the muzzle velocities of the original black powder cartridges. But you have to be sure because, uh, or have to be safe because even if the muzzle velocity is the same, it is absolutely not sure that the gas pressure is the same in your bore. So if your rifle was designed for black powder, then shoot it with black powder, never substitute it with smokeless powders. The other group of cartridges were designed for rifles or designed for smokeless charges. Their performance was way above the performance of the black powder cartridges. Just in comparison, for example, a 3030 Winchester center fire uh, cartridge that was uh, marketed from 1895 that had a muzzle velocity with a 160 grain bullet 
1971 feet per second, and if you compare it to the 3855 muzzle velocity, which was uh, which was uh, 1285, you can see that there's a huge difference here. The reloading starts with priming the cases with standard large rifle primers. The brass is made by Starline, and it's reformed and flared. Always check if the primer is in flush with the bottom of the cartridge. Now comes 44 grains of 3F Swiss powder, measured by a volumetric measure, and charged through a drop tube. This will give you more space for your bullet. Now comes a 10mm mill carton vet to protect the base of your bullet. I use Lee Pace Setter dies to reload my cases, but be careful because not all manufacturers' die sets can handle the larger diameter bullets. It must be able to flare the case mouse for the 380 bullets. The crimp is a bit stronger than what I usually like, but this is necessary for lever action rifles. Well, the 3855 is an interesting cartridge. Although its performance is not close to the 3030 caliber and probably it, it won't be considered a, a, an effective hunting caliber today, but from close ranges, from the open side close ranges, I'm pretty sure that it can take any big game in Europe. It won't cause any problem. I'm pretty sure about it because I have seen how black powder cartridges perform uh, throughout all these decades behind me. The 3855 caliber has now a great revival as a, as a target, shooting, uh, target shooting round. And uh, most of the people who use it for long-range shooting are quite satisfied with it. For example, Pedersoli is chambering its famous high wall rifle for this round, and it is performing very well even at extreme long ranges. Now let's try the rifle at 100 meters. I added some elevation to the buckhorn sides, meaning two steps up. The point of aim is the bottom center of the black aiming mark. And that I would say, ladies and gentlemen, it's a quite decent 100 meter group. I have four shots the size of, let's say, a nine ring, which is quite good with the back on side. And I have one flyer here, and that's a 10, of course. It's, the flyer is a 10 always. But, ladies and gentlemen, anyway, the rifle is accurate with black powder charges, and I'm really happy about it because it's a very faithful repro. Winchester was clever enough to offer a full program for their rifles, which means that they did not only sell the cartridges and the rifles, but they also sold the reloading tools. Their cartridge cases, for example, they were manufactured with thicker walls. Probably this is why they loaded only 48 grains of, uh, of powder and not 55 grains of powder into them. To be able to reload them, they offered two kinds of reloading tools for their 1894 rifles. One was a close copy of the famous Ideal tool, while the other was a new design that was also marketed from the 1894 year, which offered a very easy and convenient way to reload the 3855 cartridges. The tool could do everything except for casting a bullet. It could unprime, prime, resize the case, compress the powder charge, seed the bullet, crimp the bullet. 
So this was a very useful tool. The hand the tool was patented by William Mason, an excellent gunsmith that was working for Colt Remington and also Winchester, by the way. William Mason was originally hired by Winchester to design a revolver that could compete in Colt's designs. But as Colt and Winchester made an agreement and they decided not to interfere with each other's business, uh, Mason started working with Browning, making working prototypes of these rifle designs. He was actually, from 1885, the master mechanic of the company. If you are a black powder shooter, then you know that having the proper lubrication on your bullet is a must, because it is keeping your fooling soft, which means that your barrel will stay accurate from shot to shot. This is especially true for repeating rifle like this, where you won't have the chance to clean the barrel after each and every single shot. Well, you have the chance, but who the hell is going to do that? You're buying a repeating rifle because you want to shoot as many in a minute as possible. So, back in the 19th century, Winchester was also using lubrication on the bullets, and according to their catalog, the same catalog that I already mentioned, they used two kinds of lubrications. The first one was pure beef tallow. We can access it, we don't consider it a very good lubrication today, but it surely works. The second one, one was Japan wax. This is obtained from berries. It's an insoluble solid uh, obtained from berries that, are, that uh, grow only in Japan and China, or probably in other countries of Asia. Reloading straight wall metallic cartridges with black powder is a delight. It's very easy because if you have a full charge, then you can be sure that your rifle will be accurate. You can also compress the charge if you want to reach the highest velocities possible, but it is not necessary. The uncompressed charges will deliver very good accuracies for target shooting if you're a hunter and you need every single meters per second additionally for velocity, then compress the charge. The Uberti rifle is of course proof for nitrocellulose powders, but as I'm a black powder shooter and a historical shooter, I don't really care about smokeless powder as I told you, but we'll stick with black powder. Let's check it at 300 meters. Ha, ha, ha. 